Very happy morning to all of you, children, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, going to be great great grandparents, whatever stage of life you are in. As I keep reminding, what happens is that what uh, we experienced in the first few years of our life, you know, the basic growing up years has a tremendous impact on how we behave, what attitudes we have, what are our values and morals, all these things in adult life, throughout our life till the end. We don't even realize how small, small things which we have experienced as children leave a permanent impact. And in that, the most important is our parents. The way our parents interacted with us, dealt with us, what inputs they gave, their behavior, all these things have a tremendous impact throughout our uh, life. I'll tell you the reason for it uh, um, also. See, when we are very small, when we are children, our world is very limited. We don't have the freedom to travel or move out wherever we want, make friends, socialize. Everything is very, very restricted. On top of that, somehow we are made to feel that your allegiance, your obedience, everything is to your parents. So whether my parent loved me or not, whether my parent had time for me or not, whether my parent was really being nice to me or not, I gave a lot of importance to my relationship with my parent because it gave me a sense of belonging. When I said, this is my Amma, this is my Appa, what it meant was that I am not alone in this world. I am not an orphan. I do not feel emotionally insecure because I've got these great people in my life who are called father and mother. So whatever they do, we try to imbibe and we try to you know, get very heavily influenced by the attitudes, behavior, and everything of our parents. There was this very interesting uh, anecdote that there was a man who was a rowdy. You know, he was a totally antisocial element. He used to get into fights, he used to get drunk, he used to beat up people, he used to get caught by the police, and he used to be locked up so many times in jail. And he had two sons. Both these sons grew up watching his father's, their father's behavior and all this. Finally, they grew up. One of them, as expected, follows in, in his father's footsteps and became a rowdy. He also became an antisocial. He also started troubling everybody and behaving in a bad manner. But surprisingly, the other son somehow went, struggled, got himself into some government school somewhere, got some scholarship from somewhere, struggled, borrowed books from other friends and this and that, studied, studied, studied. And by the time he grew up, he became a scientist and a professor. People were very amazed. Look at this. Two children, genetically sons of the same father, exposure-wise, behavior-wise, brought up by the same uh, father. Why is it that one fellow went in one extreme and the other fellow went in the other extreme? So, there was this uh, sociologist who used to research people's behaviors and this and that. So, he went and interviewed these two young men. He asked the first one, why is it that you have taken to this life of crime and antisocial activities? He said, obviously, what do you expect? From the time I was born, I saw only this happening. This is what my father was doing day in and day out, day in and day out. His influence was so strong on me that I didn't know that there is any other way of life. So I picked up his way of life and I'm doing whatever I can. Fine, makes sense. Then the socialist went to the other uh, son and he said, what made you go like this? He said, sir, from the day I, you know, uh, was born and I started looking around, I saw my father's behavior. I saw him behaving in a very, very horrible manner. And I saw the consequences. I saw how he used to get into fights and people used to beat him up. I saw how the police used to come and lock him up. 
I saw how people used to shun him and not even talk to him, saying that he is such a good for nothing uh, fellow. And I made up my mind that this is a wonderful lesson that I have learned. This is what happens if you follow that path. So I took exactly the other path, and that is where I am today. Why I'm telling you this is just to help you understand that when we say that we imbibe a lot of uh, uh, things from you know, our parents, the reaction to that can be positive and negative. Some of us, let us uh, take more simple examples. Supposing you have a very strict father who says you should only study, you should only do this, you should not play games, you should not have friends, you should not go out, you should not do anything. You get so involved and so into it. And of course, because of your father's upbringing, you study hard, you get, you know, do well in academics and this and that. And when you grow up and when you have a family, you start telling the same thing to your children. Isn't it? But there may be another person who, okay, father is doing it with good intention and this and that. So I'm going to struggle. I'm going to come up in life. But when I get married, when I have children, I will not make my children suffer the same way. I'm going to give them freedom to do whatever they want. You see the difference? This is what happens. But today's topic is on how we parent the younger today's generation and what happens out of that. First of all, let us understand that today's children are not going to take your word for it. Here is a little cartoon that will show you the way children respond when a father or mother try to tell them something. Here is a small little family and all the books are open and both father and mother are trying to teach something to the child. You see the expression and the hand of that child. No, Papa. Enough is enough. This is not what I'm going to uh, take. And his sister is following that. So this is what I want you to be prepared for. Your parents may have got away with something like this, but today's children are not going to accept this type of, you know, what this thing. Why? You see in the second uh, uh, cartoon here, because children have got children, as I keep reminding, they are digital natives. Even when the father, you, this is a common thing, no father becomes a horse and the child sits on the father's uh, back and father takes him around like a horse and all. But you see here in today's child, even though the mother is trying to distract him with a soft toy, his mind is only on the laptop. So this is the basic difference between the past generation and the younger uh, you know, uh, generation. There is a lot of influence among peers. You know that also. We call teenagers as people with, you know, uh, peer pressure and peer age and all that. But that is no longer true. Younger and younger and younger children are undergoing peer pressure. Children tell each other, their own friends, their classmates and their, you know, peers what to do, what not to do. They influence them very heavily. In a lighter manner, here's a little cartoon which I picked up about how, you know, this girl is uh, uh, telling the other uh, uh, one, you have to study for tests, dummy. You can't just put a memory stick in your ear. The child thinks that if he takes that memory stick and he plugs it into his ear, like the same way as you plug something into the computer and the computer gives you results, he, he has started thinking that way. This may be a joke, but it is a fact that these digital natives are influenced so much by what is happening in the world around them that the traditional impact of what we used to do is long, long, long uh, gone. These children are perpetually into the digital era. Are we aware of that? You know that there's a lot being told about children becoming overweight. Children are eating junk food, particularly urban uh, children, children from upwardly mobile parents, children who have you know, the best of everything, children who live 
in uh, uh, like uh, in small nests into BHK three BHK uh, caught up almost like a human uh, zoo. So what is happening to these children is that their world is shrinking to 17 inches of the laptop or six inches of their mobile. Here is one child. You have a look and see a typical youngster of the urban age nuclear family, perhaps parents doing extremely uh, well. This is a symbolism of what this child you know, looks uh, uh, like and what he does. Got it? No? Yeah, here he is. Does the child remind you of any child that you know? Snacking, staring at the computer, hand on the mouse, and that is the only world. He doesn't know beyond that what is happening. I am very concerned about such children. Please do something to ensure that the children under your care are not moving in that uh, you know, direction. To start with, as I always keep reminding you, never tell, tell children things like when I was your age. Because they just do not connect to it. Yes, once in a while you can give them, if you can generate interest in them, and make them think by talking about you know what life was in when you were children and the way you were brought up but if you're trying to use that to influence the child that see this is how i was brought up so this is how you should be brought up they are just not willing to listen to you this you know attitude this way of behavior just does not mean anything to today's uh, uh, children you have to let go of uh, your uh, children. One of the most important things today, which I keep reminding parents, teachers, all elders is teach the child autonomy. Teach the child to take right decisions. Teach the child to manage his emotions. Teach the child how to build up his emotional quotient, emotional intelligence. That is the best and the highest of education that you can give to the uh, child. And you can do that only if you're aware of what is happening to the child. Some parents somehow think that by putting a child in a good school, by paying the fees, by buying everything that the child needs, by sending the child to hobby classes and vacations, they feel that they are taking care of uh, everything. But the responsibility doesn't end there. This is what I see sometimes when I'm invited to parent-teacher meetings to uh, you know, address the um, parents. There are some wonderful parents who are totally involved and very, very connected. But there are parents also who neglect that. It's OK, I'm busy, I can't attend. That one day in a semester or in a year or when you are asked to come to the uh, school and you are not coming or only one parent comes. So here was this cartoon that I picked up. The child has come back from uh, school and is telling the parents, read the quote here. My teacher noticed you were not there at the parent-teacher night. She wanted to ask you why I never take interest in anything. The teacher was waiting for the parents to come and to ask the parents, why is it that your child is not taking interest in anything? But the parents are not interested in the parent-teacher meeting, so they have not come. Now, what is the message that they have sent to the child? That it's okay. You don't have to be interested. Just because the teacher's called doesn't mean that I have to go. The same way, if teacher is teaching, the child says, I don't necessarily have to study. This is what I want you to understand how fast and how quickly children pick up from their uh, parents, small, small uh, uh, things. A lot can actually be done if we are you know, aware of these uh, uh, things. But firstly, recall the way you were brought up. 
check out what is relevant today and what is not relevant out of that. Many things are not relevant. Some things are of interest only of academic value. Some things can actually be done even now. So trifurcate into that. Those which can be implemented and are practical, my recommendation to you is tell the child that this is what I want to do. Involve the child in the process before laying down the rules and before giving instructions to the uh, uh, child. And in a different manner, talk about something which you know was happening. I remember one of our helping hand volunteers who was 80 plus at that time had narrated to us an incident saying that when he was born and brought up in a village, they used to have this annual, uh, I mean, sorry, weekly fair. So Sante, once in a week, his father would pile up hay on the bullock cart. And the previous night, he would tie down the hay properly, put it on that uh, bullock cart. Late in the night, he would feed dinner to this little fellow. He was very small at that time. He would tie a lantern to the uh, bullock cart so that people coming or going past would know that there is a bullock cart going. Put this fellow on a little mattress on top of the hay. Tell him, go to sleep and push the bullocks. And the bullocks would start walking. Miles and miles to the Sante. And they would go there. They would know what place to stop. And the bullocks would stop. Can you believe that? And this fellow would be sleeping. Early in the morning, the father would come on the cycle with his breakfast. Get him down from there, wash his face, give him uh, breakfast. And start doing the sale of whatever he had to do in the Sante. Now, that was such a fascinating story to uh, me. And I'm sure it's fascinating even for the children, as long as the children are not told that you too have to do this. Give that autonomy to children. Let children go up in a happy environment, thinking that they are in a nice, secure world of today's thing. Give them alternatives to being in front of a screen all the time. Here's a little picture of a little boy who is sitting surrounded by his soft toys. There's a dog here, there's a bear there, and there's a pile of books, picture books. He'll pick up one, he won't like it, he'll put it away, he'll pick up another one, then maybe he'll cuddle his doggy or his uh, bear. Now this child will not feel the absence of the screen and the technology and there's so much to learn. And when this child is small, probably the parents sat with him and read out before he learned reading. Showed him the pictures and read out the words. That's how the child picks up the habit of uh, reading. These are the things which one can do at all times if you genuinely have the interest. And there's another interesting last cartoon. I thought I'll show it uh, to you before I wind up with some of the important uh, uh, points which I want to give for today in the first half of the uh, uh, session. This, I think, is one of the most important thing. Quality time between the parent and the child. They're sitting and looking out of the window. There's such fascinating things outside. This child is very small. You can't always take the child out and do activities. So right here at home, here is a parent with that little child. And both of them are excitedly looking at something outside the window. And the type of interest that is generated in the child, the child, as you can see here, is enthusiastically pointing out to something. When the child, this little one, keeps growing up, with this sort of fascination, this sort of curiosity, this sort of closeness. You see the warmth that the child is experiencing sitting in the lap of the parent, the touch. These are things which add to the child, which is needed very badly. You may or may not have been cuddled by your uh, parents. They may or may not have had time to you know, give you affection, attention, 
but it doesn't matter because you probably had a grandfather, grandmother, uncle, aunt, cousin, somebody or the other to substitute the parents. If today the children are growing up in a nuclear family, they definitely need these little, little tips and techniques that I have been, you know, talking uh, about. Parents can be very good role models to the children because children do not listen to their parents. They mimic uh, them. Yesterday evening, I spent with one of my very dear friend who was my student in our DCS program very, very long uh, uh, back. She's coming close to 90 years of uh, age. And she's almost bedridden. She can still manage, her, thankfully, to get up, go to the washroom, sit up and eat, take a little walk up to the gate, and then she comes back to her uh, bed. But no. Wait. But when she was talking about you know, her children, grown up children, of course, middle aged children. The way they are taking care of her, the way they are doing little, little gestures and loving her and providing for her. They are both busy people. They have their own families. They have their own commitments. But the way they have shown or expressed or demonstrated their love and care for her, that makes her life so beautiful. She was in tears when she was talking about her children, tears of joy. And that is what, you know, and the grandchildren must be observing how their parents are, you know, treating the grandmother. And that is one of the best education that you can give to your child. Number one, because your children, when they grow up, will also mimic you and do things, you know, that they have seen you uh, doing. And number two. Even if you don't want anything from them and you don't want their whole attitude towards life, their attitude towards age, their attitude towards maturity and towards relationship, it will really, really, you know, improve things. The other factor, as you are all aware of, is children of today's generation are gr growing up without knowing what it means to have delayed gratification. They all want instant gratification. And that is something which can be very hurtful. You know that at, in your uh, um, age, you had to wait for anything and everything that you wanted. You were hungry and you would go to your mother and mother would say, food is cooking. It will take half an hour, one hour. Once the food is ready, then only I can feed you. But today, children want that pizza in 13 minutes. Children want instant gratification and it's not restricted to food. As they grow up, it will even come to relationships. Remember that they will not be patient, even in terms of building, sustaining, understanding and being patient with your near and uh, dear. This, if it happens to children, can really affect them badly. So whether you are a parent, you are a teacher, you are a concerned adult, you are a grandparent, whatever you are, please make sure that you take this little interest. And along with that comes one very important uh, thing. I am a strong believer that parenting is not one single word. Parenting is a combination of fathering and mothering. Ten fathers cannot give what one mother can. And ten mothers cannot give what one father can. That's how nature has made human beings and most other species also. That when a man and woman come together in union, then a child is produced. And the upbringing has to be done the same way. So please understand that if you want to give today's child that sense of emotional security, 
then the child should feel that I have a mother and a father. Even in an extreme case where one of the parents is missing for some reason, if the, let's say the father is missing, the child should have a father figure in his life, need not be a biological father. These are things which are very, very important. You don't even understand. You don't even see, you know, how uh, the things are. Another aspect which I have been uh, seeing, which I thought I'll share with you is, I get a lot of uh, uh, people say, the let's take the son. The son is a little naughty, rebellious fellow, and he has been pampered. His sister has been disciplined and put a lot of restrictions have been put on her, but he has been given all the freedom because he is the little prince of the house. So what he does is, he neglects his mother. Father is a disciplinarian and is strict, so he has to obey what the father says. Mother is very soft and kind or whatever it is. Or even if she is not, he doesn't care for her. He neglects his mother. He grows up. He is a teenager. He is an adolescent. He starts further ignoring and neglecting his uh, uh, mother till he gets married. Now, once he is married and he settles down and he has a certain amount of responsibility, he suddenly realizes that I have been neglecting my mother so badly. I have not done anything for my mother. So you know what this guy does? He puts the onus on his wife. You have to take care of my mother. My mother did so much for me. My mother has done so much for the family. My mother, even at this age, struggled so hard. So you have to take the responsibilities. You have to take care of my mother, etc. Now, this is a very funny situation. It is his mother, not her mother. Yes, as part of the family, as a you know, daughter-in-law, she will do it. But passing the buck to her, I think that's not uh, fair. I'm just giving you this one example to show you how often we tend to get into a lot of very subtle behavior patterns because of our upbringing, because of the way we behaved when we were children and sometimes feeling guilty, sometimes trying to make up for it, sometimes getting very angry with our old parents. All this is a very vicious cycle which goes around. But let me assure you, whatever stage of life you are in, whether your parents exist or they have passed away, whether you have children yet or no, there is always something that you can do. Okay. So as I close this first half of the uh, session and I invite uh, uh, Sonal to come and give you some quick uh, tips, I just thought I will share with you a very funny little video of a child who has been forced to sit in a meditation class. Here he is. so cute right when a child is forced to do something which adults feel is right but child is not ready for it <laughs> they will still try to cooperate their best as much as they can but we don't see that we see what the child is not doing no that happens very naturally to us because we feel we are adults and we know everything and we can, and we want to teach children the best because you know it has worked, but you know it has worked. We have to help children their method, what works for them. That is what will help children build their confidence, their self-esteem. Yes, that was how what I perceived from the video that we saw just now. Okay, you know what? What is today? It is 1st April. I'm not talking anything to fool anybody about. 
but today is our dcs 23's valedictory function and if you can drop in before one o'clock you will see how everybody is dressed up waiting for that event happening at iat today the whole year year after year rather each dcs batch inspires us motivates us and gives us a feel there are a lot more to come and do that you know kindness to the society understand how to speak without even harming anybody create that harmony around and harmony within that has been the motto of dcs and year after year we see this batch is going and that's the feeling we have that some more are creating harmony around and harmony amongst themselves yeah so our admissions have started whomever you feel who wants to join this journey with banjara give them a uh, number of banjara and tell them to contact anis you all very well know anis how beautifully she talks and maintains that harmony within and harmony around she is the wonderful role model for us right apart from that next saturday i just want to tell because this is related to today's topic we are having a one day workshop on understanding learning difficulty earlier days learning dif difficulty was not identified and children were battered with dialogues like you are so lazy you can't write you can't understand blah 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 but those children grew up some did well some got succumbed with the emotional baggage somehow they are living their life but not to the fullest so if you think you want to help anybody it can be teacher parent counselors anyone who wants to understand what is this learning difficulty and what can i do as an individual to help these children you are most welcome to join the workshop again for details call up anis she will help you out in that right hope to see you all soon and many many good mornings to everyone who is sending those good wishes and all the best in this journey of harmony within and harmony around yes thank you so much kamali yes thanks a lot sonal thanks a lot anis also for behind the scenes doing all these activities i just wanted to make an announcement before we i start off with the chat box um, i felt that with people's attention span going down we announced this one hour uh, you know session every saturday and i'm extremely thankful to those of you who spend the entire hour you know participating and they don't log off halfway through the thing 19% 95% of the people when they log in and they devote this hour to the uh, them they do find it interesting enough to stick around but we don't want to penalize them so what i decided was that from today onwards 11 to 11:30 my talk as you have already heard after that it depends on the type of questions the type of number of comments that come in whenever they get over we will wind up we will not stretch the session just because it is not yet 12 o'clock okay so we'll start that process today by seeing how many of you have got questions comments and all that and anis keeps putting them one by one and i respond to that so here is the first one asha says isn't it that parents and children are the same yes in certain ways i do agree but in certain ways we are not the same also no? see when we are a child we are like you know that potter's clay it can be molded into any shape we are so vulnerable that one tip of the finger of that potter can change our shape by the time we become adults we are hardened and then if somebody tries to change our shape we crack so that is the basic difference between children and their adults or parents yes sasha says it is just that parents have little more experience in life they are our equals in fact now i would even say asha that 
sometimes children have more experience than their uh, parents and i'm talking about older uh, children if there are children who come to teenage or who have become adults and all that it is no longer true that the parents can say i am 30 years older than you and i have had this experience and that experience and all that a lot of that experience may be outdated a lot of that experience may not be relevant to life today so in certain ways i do agree with asha and so many others who feel that way i hope that children have a greater experience greater exposure there is so much that we the so called elders can learn from them keep that in mind okay chandrika says ali i find many young parents permanently on their mobile to the extent mobile has become a kind of pacifier to the toddler a whimper a start of a cry the mobile is thrust into their hands i mean this is something which i have been shouting from the rooftops not now but for the last at least 15 years please do not allow technology to become your master technology is a very good slave but a very horrible master and if we allow technology to become our master automatically the technology says that your children also belong to me like it used to happen in the good old days if there is a slave and that slave produces a child the master would say your child is also my slave he doesn't have the choice of going away from uh, here he is born to you you are my slave so here i am we when we read those things in history we think no that how horrible life must have been and all that but we are going back to that we are really you know doing very wrong things with uh, the uh, children without even realizing it we just think it is something okay silly child as you said no has been whimpering or crying or something thrust the mobile and start playing some songs or some cartoons or something and the child will be happy no we are doing a great disservice to the children akila says good morning now due to lot of exposure children at a very young age itself are aware of many things good and bad sometimes it becomes very difficult to understand their language the slang or behavior as you said it's very true that children don't have the patience to wait along with this while i agree with akila i also want to add one thing when you say that children understand good and bad i want to modify that a little bit in a children's dictionary there is no good and bad there is no right or wrong there is no moral and immoral in a child child's dictionary it is only actions which are approved by elders and actions which are disapproved by elders you understand the difference when the child is small and when the child is under great influence by parents teachers etc the child has to follow a lot of rules and regulations when he or she is small they have no choice so they succumb that is what we call as forced compliance but when they come to adolescence and beyond that when they realize that i have autonomy i have freedom i am strong enough to do what i want they start questioning and when nobody is there to help them to understand their questions why certain rules and all that were made i'll give you a quick example sometimes you know when children say things like you know why should we study so many subjects why should there be so many exams why should i be told that you have to come back at such and such time when i go to play whatever um it is i give them a very simple example i tell them that when you grow up you will learn how to ride a bike or to drive a car and you will also learn and you will get a license you will have a vehicle now you have to drive that vehicle on the left side of the road you can question and say what's so great about the left side of the road in fact in most of the world except the commonwealth people drive on the right side of the road so why should i be forced to drive on the left side of the road there are very obvious reasons and answers to that first of all if you drive on the right side of the road and a policeman sees you he's going to catch hold of you you may even lose your license secondly if you go on the right side when everybody is going on the left side there may be an accident because people don't realize that you are coming from the opposite uh, uh, the right uh, side 
there's going to be chaos. So we follow the rules. Then you go for your higher studies to some country like America or whatever. And there you realize everybody is driving on the right side of the road. Can you go there and say, for 25 years, I've been driving on the left side. I've got a license in India to prove that. So here also, I will drive on the left side. No, you'll probably be locked up in jail or thrown away from the country and sent back. So you have to change. You have to start driving from the right side. Then you finish some studies and this and that, and you decide that I want to go back to my country. You come back to India. Again, you have to drive on the left side. Now, logically, you can question it. But there are certain things which we have to obey. And that is where we need to make children understand that not every rule, every regulation can have a logical answer. But in the interests of everybody concerned, we all have to follow certain norms. That's all. Hmm. Vinita says, Ali, as you had mentioned earlier, as how touch works like magic to children, but some of them are very uncomfortable as parents because they were also deprived when they were kids and continue the same behavior. I mean, few of them. Yes, Vinita, it's not just a few. You'll be amazed at how many of us who are deprived of touch cannot easily touch our children. There are so many people to whom a close, intimate touch only means sex with their partner. All other touch has to be just a formality. Touching the feet of your elders, for example, and we don't even touch. We just bow down and come a few inches from their feet and back off. We don't give nice, warm, platonic hugs to people whom we care for. It's okay. We have a right to live the life way we want to, but we can't do it with children. And as Vinita rightly said, a lot of parents are doing it with the children. And children who grow up deprived of touch, the warm, loving, caring touch from their parents, from their elders, from their close relatives, have a you know skin craving, as we call it. And if there's this girl who grows up like this without having had the warmth of touch from her parents, and particularly the male parent, like her father or brother and all that, and one guy, he may be worth her or not worth her, but he comes and he starts touching her, hugging her, kissing her, and she goes overboard. So many cases we see of such things are happening. So I'm glad Vinita reminded us, upbringing of the children should include warm, caring, and good touch. That is one way you can communicate your love to them. Chandika says, how important do you think adversity quotient also needs to be developed along with emotional quotient? Will it lead to more anxiety if introduced? No, Chandika, it is the way you introduce it. For example, when we talk about you know, uh, uh, creating uh, awareness in children about child abuse, I can put it in such a way that the child can get absolutely traumatized. Oh, there are these predators around. They will come and molest me. They will do something with me. I will be in trouble. That message can come from an elder or a message saying that, yes, there are certain ways and means to protect yourself. Here, the example that I give is you're walking on the footpath or away from the main road and traffic. You can walk, run, skip. You don't have to worry because no vehicle is coming close. But if you're on a busy road, you want to cross the road, you have to be aware that some fellow may be driving so fast or he may not see you and there can be an accident, including even if you're walking on the edge of the footpath, some fellow is trying to avoid some other vehicle, he swerves to the left, he can knock you down. So when we explain like this, the child doesn't get scared of going out on the road. The same thing needs to be told to. Uh, children. So when we talk about adversity quotient, that is that how to be aware of what adversity, what challenges, what hurdles you will face in life, it entirely depends on how you present it to the child. Surekha says, widowed at the young age of 31, my mother did not choose to sit on her pity pot and keep crying. 
she accepted responsibility and took initiative. She kept on saying, believe in yourself. That's one of the best lessons that a mother can give to a child. Have faith in your abilities. Without a reasonable confidence in your own abilities, you cannot be successful or happy. What a message Surekha's mother has given to her. And particularly to a, you know, a girl child. Even today, with all technology, modernism, all these things, girl child still needs that boost of her self-esteem. The child needs emotional security. And that is what a young widowed mother gave to Surekha. It was the best thing that she could give to her child more than sending her to expensive schools and colleges or sending her abroad for education or whatever we normally believe is what we should give to our children. Ha. Shobha says, Sonal, how great souls you all are. You made me more humble towards the people. Thank you very much, Shobha. I'll convey that to Sonal. And we really feel very touched when we get these genuine you know, positive strokes. It really boosts us up. Ha. Dipti says, hello, Ali. Can I ask, where does obsessive, compulsive, or controlling behavior in adults start from? Is it because of the way we have been parented, or is it just genetics or something? Obsessive compulsive disorder, as you know, you know, OCD does have a genetic element. That's what scientists and doctors tell us. But since there are no confirmed records of people of the earlier generation, no proper long term medical records, we cannot say for 100 percent that it is genetic and to what extent. So, yes, if somebody says that this child's father, grandfather, grandmother, somebody or the other had the same obsessive and compulsive habits, please be more aware. Please teach this child not to get into obsession or compulsion. The other part of it is behavioral aspects. The child may be feeling insecure. The child may be scared of something. There could be so many reasons why a child you know, leans towards that. And then there are a lot of children who are obsessive, who feel that compulsion to do something or to do repeatedly some activities. But I won't put them all in the category of OCD, D is disorder. There are a few who go to the extreme there, they just cannot manage. If a person goes back three times to check whether he has locked his door properly or not, I would say it is an obsession, but I would not say it's a disorder. But if he knows that he is going to miss the train or plane, and yet he goes back for the third time to check, taking the risk of you know, missing out his flight or his train, then yes, it is a disorder. And that has to be dealt with by professionals. Shobha says, some parents stick on to maternal grandparents and not to paternal grandparents. They want their children to close to them. Yes, it does happen. The way our uh, you know, society is, somehow the relationship between a daughter and mother is much more stronger and closer than the relationship between a son and the parents, which is the example I gave you just before the uh, break. So what happens is the grandparents find it easier to tell their daughter that you get your child here or you behave like this with the child or we would like to take care of the child. The same grandparents don't find it convenient enough to tell their son and daughter-in-law about their uh, uh, children. Similarly, in a lot of areas, the mother also feels that way. These are my parents. I can trust them. I know that they will do good for my children, but I'm not very sure whether my in-laws will behave in the right way. I get a little suspicious of them. There's nothing much we can do about it except to create that awareness that both grandparents are needed by the child, right? Alice says, it's same when they do good. When children don't do according to the parents, they are not same. That is what I'm uh, saying, that children do not have right and wrong. Children only have what is approved and what is not approved, and they behave accordingly. 
A lot of habits of children are based on that. Seema says, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this immensely enlightening session, Ali. Please take session on connecting with teenagers, particularly with the late teens who are lingering on the edge of adulthood. I think that's a very good suggestion, Seema. I will make a note of it right now. I think you know, you know we should do something on that uh, area. I'm writing it down because my memory should not uh, fail. And though we, since we fix up our topics a few weeks in advance, it won't happen in the next one or two or three weeks. But I'll put it down in the next uh, you know week, which we have not fixed the topic for. You be patient. I told you delayed gratification you have to have, and you will get it. I assure you of that. Okay, Vinita says and hugs says and speaks so much. You just have to give a hug and don't say anything. I agree with you, Vinita. It is something which somehow in our culture has become a little, you know, awkward. Somewhere or the other, we feel you know inadequate when giving a nice warm hug to somebody, including people who are close to us. It could be your grandfather, you know, whose skin and bones, who's feeling isolated and lonely. People come, touch his feet, give respects to him, say nice things to him and go away. But what he needs, what both his body and mind needs is for someone to come there and give him a nice warm hug so that he feels that energy coming from a youthful body to him. He feels connected to that uh, person. These are very, very important areas. I want all of you to please keep in mind, even if you're not used to it, start practicing uh, uh, this. Yes, Chandrika, I agree with you. That fabulous message by Surekha's mother. We, all of us, I think, should convey our gratitude to her because through Surekha, we have come to know such wonderful aspects of that great lady. Surekha says, how can we develop a capacity within a child to say no politely and assertively? Assertiveness itself is a skill, no? It's a very basic life skill or human uh, skill. And thankfully, by now, we have enough ways and means to understand, learn, and practice assertiveness. In fact, I brought out a nice workbook on assertiveness. Anybody can contact the office and pick up a copy. We give hard copies and soft copies, whichever way, way you want. Pick up a copy of that. In that, there are a lot of small, small exercises. Most of them are applicable to both children as well as uh, adults. Whoever wants to learn this skill of assertive, either you are very, very you know, submissive and you keep giving up to others, or you are a very impulsive person, you get aggressive, you become dominant, either way, to find that mean path, which as Sonal was telling you a little while back, you are in harmony with yourself and you are in harmony with others. Please pick up that uh, skill. Roshan says, parents are role models to their children. Never believed in beating them. Luckily, my children are very well brought up and are happy with themselves. No, Roshan, it's not luckily. It is because of what you did. You understood certain aspects of parenting. You understood the you know, needs of the children and you gave them what they needed. It does not happen by luck. Let us all be very clear on that. If a child grows up to be a wonderful child, it is because of good parenting. And if the child grows up to you know, go astray or something like that, something has been lacking in the parenting, grandparenting, whoever were the important adults in the child's life during the formative uh, years. Surika says, whenever I experience pain and confusion in my life, the story of my childhood comes back to me again and again. I remind myself, I come from sterner stuff. My mother had nerves of steel, and so do I. I shall not give in under this. Wonderful example, all of you, that if you have this type of a parent, or if you have children or grandchildren today, if you can be that parent to the child, see the long-term effects. Surekha has grown up. She has spent half her life. She has brought up her own children. But she says, even today, I feel that I can be a person of steel and I can face challenges because of the role modeling that my mother did to me. See the impact? 
And that is what I want all of you to practice. Roshan says, my music teacher's granddaughter is doing her PhD in genetics. She has found out that after a generation, traits are similar. So her traits are similar to her grandmother. That is my music teacher. Yes, genetics is a very fascinating field and it is comparatively a new field. A lot of new things are coming up. But we will have to wait for some time to really get the complete grasp of how genetics plays an important role, what DNA does to us and all that. Thankfully, a lot is being unraveled and all these things are coming out by the younger generation. And we will continue to learn a lot about the genetic element, right? Sri Devi says, we can practice hugging trees too, no? For accepting, receiving the messages, like listening sort of empowers ourselves. I don't know what happened to him. There was this wonderful person called Bahuguna, if I'm right, who started the Chipko movement. He said whenever people want to cut down trees for whatever the progress of civilization, he used to get volunteers who would go and hug the tree and stand there with their arms around the tree saying, please don't uh, knock down this tree. Now, it is not just the tree who is getting the benefit and being preserved. It is you also who feel nice. Since I started talking to my plants on my little roof garden, I don't know how much it has, uh, you know, affected uh, them or whether they really feel happy by my talking to them. But I assure you, I feel nice. I feel I have a set of friends with whom I can share anything that I want to. They're so non-judgmental. They're so quiet. They listen so well. And that is what the flora and fauna are all about. Asha says, very good articles are published in Deccan Herald on dealing with teenagers children on adulthood. I've learned a lot reading them. Yes, in fact, last week we had a very nice article about, you know, body image and how body shaming does and what, you know, youngsters, particularly girls can do in terms of building up their body image, which also leads to good self-esteem. But for that, you have to do something which I do, but most people don't do anymore. That is read newspapers. If you don't do it on a regular basis, at least subscribe for the Sunday newspaper, whichever one you like. Read on Sundays. You have comparatively more time. Some very good articles come in most of the newspapers. Right, Sridevi says, because of DCS, I became a good mother for my girl child. I feel so thankful and grateful. Yes, Sridevi, maybe we have helped you. Maybe we have given you input, but it is you who has put in the efforts. So I congratulate you for that. Okay. So with that, we are coming to the end of the session and we shall sign off just a minute before 12 o'clock, reminding you that next Saturday at 11 o'clock, I'll be taking a break from the workshop that we are doing next Saturday. We are doing this workshop on learning difficulties and how to deal with children, how to understand them, whether you're a parent, teacher, counselor, whatever you are. So we will be having that workshop right here in Banjara, which is face to face in the classroom. But between 11 and 12, I'll take a break and I will be with you to deal with this topic, which is the stresses of watching, staring at the screen, how it affects us physically and how it affects us mentally. We have to be aware. You can't get away from the screen. The screen has become part of your life now, but definitely we can take some precautions. Uh, that's what I'm preparing my notes and my points. In fact, if any one of you has some inputs to give me on this topic, please do so. Please send it to, to me either through email or text or whatever means you can or even make a phone call and uh, uh, tell you. And I wind up with Salma's note. Thank you, Dr. Ali. I read our DCS note repeatedly as it helps my day to day life or handling of life. Yes, that's all we should all strive to do. So thank you very much for a wonderful morning. I shall see you next Saturday at 11 o'clock. Bye-bye.